started. Almost there. Welcome everyone, so happy to have you with us. Um, this is our first uh, preservation advocacy workshop, Tools and Strategies. So happy to have you all here on the first of four of these. They are going to be the next three Tuesdays, same time, same place. I'm Taylor Roden, I'm the Community Events Manager here at Historic Seattle, and our mission is saving meaningful places to foster lively communities. Historic Seattle knows that our properties and programs occupy the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. This acknowledgement is not a substitute for developing relationships with indigenous communities or for honoring indigenous stories as we share our collective history, but it's the first step in recognizing the people whose land we do occupy. So before we dive in and I turn it over to our awesome presenters, I do have a few housekeeping items. I definitely wanna start by thanking our sponsors who make our education programming possible. Bricklayer is an allied craft workers, Local One, Alaska and Washington, Daniels Real Estate, The Greystone and Gridiron, Selling Community Foundation and Urban Villages and Railspur. And I also want to thank my historic Seattle colleagues uh, for the collective efforts in making this program and the next three that you're going to see possible. And I also want to extend a big special thank you to the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation for co-presenting today's program with us. And just a reminder to all of us that, especially with programs like this, this is a safe space for all participants and for all of us to learn together. So racism, sexism, homophobic comments, discrimination, insults, all of that stuff that we all know not to do won't be tolerated. And um, if we do see that, or if you're experiencing that, please message us and we will, we will take care of it. So I'm going to turn it over right now to our two guest speakers, we're gonna start things off with Eugenia Wu, who's the Director of Preservation Services here at Historic Seattle. And then after Eugenia, we're going to hear from um, Hui Fang, the Preservation Programs Director at the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation. And I believe both presentations are roughly 20 to 25 minutes, so we'll have some time at the end of today's program for your questions. And if you're tuning in on YouTube, please feel free to put your questions in the YouTube chat. I'll be monitoring both the Zoom chat and the YouTube chat, and I'll be sure to relay your questions to our presenters. With that, um, Eugenia, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Taylor. And I'm gonna uh, quickly share my screen. Okay. You can see that okay? Great, thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Eugenia Wu. I'm the Director of Preservation Services at Historic Seattle. And uh, my focus um, is historic preservation advocacy here at the organization. And uh, I work very closely with Jeff Murdoch, our Preservation Advocacy Manager, who is also um, in this meeting. Um, and uh, we love to work on advocacy and, and sometimes it's a, bit of a contact sport in Seattle and other times it's just, um, you know, really um, uh, not so bad. <laughs> so, but, but we want to talk about um, some of the, the framework of historic preservation and some of the tools and strategies. And then, um, and then if we found from the Washington Trust will focus on statewide advocacy. So uh, what I love about preservation advocacy is that it really takes many forms. You don't, it's not rocket science. Um, you don't necessarily need a degree in it. Um, it really takes a lot of just strategic thinking, um, a lot of passion and belief in what you're doing um, and understanding sort of the lay of the land, how things work, um, who does what, who decides what. Um, and so when, when you sort of get that sense of sort of knowing what that lay of the land is, it's a lot easier to um, focus and sort of to strategize and kind of pick your battles in a way. Um, and so I want to offer this framework that I mentioned. And so there's sort of four kind of main areas and you can sort of see those here in government, nonprofit and private. And within each one, um, you, there are uh, a lot of different players involved. And this is not an exhaustive list. Um, I know it's a lot of words right now, but since this is being recorded, you could always go back and um, take a closer look. The, um, 
uh, the, on the government level, you have sort of the federal, your state, and your local level of preservation. Um, and so that has um, a lot of, um, it, it sort of sets the stage in a way for what the states and the local groups do. Sometimes um, what we do, we collaborate and it's connected and other times it's pretty separate. It just depends on the issue. With preservation advocacy, it's very much a case by case basis. And so, um, so, you know, we have the National Park Service, which oversees the National Register of Historic Places program, um, among many other things. There's the Advisory Council, which is a federal agency, and it advises the president and Congress on policies, and among other things. And every state has what's called a State Historic Preservation Officer, or the SHPO. Um, ours is uh, Dr. Allison Brooks, and that is with and she works within the Washington State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. Different states have different departments on where the SHPO resides. Um, and th that we work closely with, the sh with, with DAP on a lot of different things as well. And um, they're very important in the whole historic preservation kind of scheme of things. And they administer the National Register program as well. Um, and then we have the local groups, the local programs, like the City of Seattle and King County. Um, and we work very closely with them as well. And so they are, you sort of see these levels of government and how they kind of intersect. And then we have nonprofit, uh, the National Trust, uh, which uh, offers, does a lot of policy work and grant making, among other things, preservation action, does a lot of lobby uh, work and advocacy as well. And then you're gonna hear from me about the Washington Trust. Um, and so, you know, we are Historic Seattle and we, we, a lot of what we do is advocacy along with some of the other um, work that we do, which is also very important with education and real estate development. Um, and also we work very closely with the local historical societies and preservation organizations. And on the private side, that really opens it up to a lot of different people, including many of you who are um, here today, um, including individuals and grassroots groups. Uh, I don't know where we would be without the many friends of groups or the same our kind of fill in the blank. Um, they, that's really at the grassroots local level. Uh, and we couldn't do our work without them because we hear from them sort of what's in, what places matter to them and what's important to them. Um, kind of rallying out with obviously the property owners and developers and sort of the technical experts that sort of, um, you know, advise and help us with projects and rehab and preservation and all that stuff. And of course, the attorneys are important too. Um, and the schools and universities, colleges and universities are really key because we want to uh, educate and promote the next generation of preservationists. So that's sort of this general framework here. The um, wanted to talk about the sort of this sort of the modern preservation movement really stems from the 1960s. Preservation, you know, was happening or you know in the 19th century and the 20th century, so it wasn't just a, a, a mid 20th century thing. But this is sort of where it got solidified with the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, um, and this is the law that sort of dictates a lot of um, what happens with preservation and cultural res resources as well. Uh, one of these is a section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. I'm not going to go too much into this because there could be a three-day seminar just on 106 alone. It's quite wonky, but I wanted you to be aware of it as a tool that's uh, quite important. Um, it may not necessarily stop or uh, prevent demolition of a resource, but it provides a robust process to look at what adverse effects there may be on, um, on a historic place based on a project. And this gets triggered when um, federal agencies take uh, into account what the effects of their pro undertakings might be. An undertaking could be an actual project. Um, it could be funding to uh, that pr um, federal funding that goes to a state or a local agency to do projects, or it could be a FCC license for a cell tower. It could be a license to open up a bank branch is pretty varied, but essentially it gets triggered um, it's either by actual um, an action by the federal government or by uh, funding that they pass on to others. And so, um, and it, they look at only properties that are either eligible or are listed in the national register. And 
And then they, it's a process by looking at what the proposed project is. Does it have any impact on the historic resource? And um, if there is, you know, is it adverse? And is there other ways to avoid that impact or can it be mitigated? Um, so it's a process. This example here um, shows the West Seattle Battle, Ballard Link Extension uh, project with Sound Transit, which is currently going on right now um, in terms of environmental impact statement review. So that's a, kind of a hot topic uh, as, we, um, as we look at the transportation in, in the city. And transportation projects often trigger Section 106 because of, of, of sort of the enormity of the project. So essentially it looks at the line, the proposed lines and sort of what might be impacted and what historic resources might be affected. The National Register of Historic Places. Uh, this is the official list of places that are worthy of preservation. Um, just because something isn't on the National Register doesn't mean it's not significant. It just means it hasn't been, a nomination hasn't been submitted yet and reviewed. But this is um, important in terms of it's, it sort of shows sort of, it highlights what, what is significant in the country and also um, a property listed on the National Register or in a historic district could be eligible for federal historic tax credits, which often could help make a pro uh, preservation project um, uh, happen. Um, there are over 96,000 properties listed as of 2020. Um, and when you include the districts, you, you have a lot more buildings involved. That's why it, it expands to 1.8 million resources. So to be on the National Register, there's a criteria, there are criteria for evaluation. Essentially, it has to be at least 50 years old. If it's less than 50, then um, they look at another criterion called Criterion G, which looks at exceptional significance. And these four criteria are A, B, and C, and it corresponds to the significance that I have sort of noted there on the third bullet point. Essentially, it needs to be associated with events, activities, or developments important in the past with people's lives that are important. And this needs to be more than George Washington slept here. It needs to be something you know, more significant than that. Um, uh, oftentimes uh, we look at the architecture, the landscape architecture, engineering achievements, and also we look at archeology span as well, archeological resources. So who decides? Um, and so generally, um, for Washington, the State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation, a nomination gets submitted to, to them and then they review it and it goes to the Governor's Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. And they make recommendations to the State Historic Preservation Officer who then forwards that recommendation to the Park Service. And it's ultimately up to the Park Service to conduct the final review and to decide whether to list or not. And once it's listed, then it's then it's um, then then that's great. And if it doesn't get listed, then um, it could get listed on the Washington Heritage Register, which is our state register. But from what I know, I mean, most of the properties that go to the Park Service um, have gotten listed in Washington State. There's a whole vetting process that goes on before that, and so it's um, it, it's it's usually um, it usually happens. And here are some examples of some properties listed in the National Register here in Washington State, a uh, nice variety of them. Um, you can sort of see this uh, from small towns to larger cities, residences, to all these kinds of property types. Next, we have the, uh, on a um, more local level, the King County Historic Preservation Program. And I'm just gonna touch on this briefly because our next workshop, uh, next Tuesday, April 19th, Sarah Steen, from King County Landmarks Program, she's going to, the, the whole um, program will be focused on King County. And she, she, everything you wanna know, you can ask her. Uh, but essentially it was um, established in 1978 and these are all the sort of the different services that the staff there offers. So the Landmarks Program for the county is, um, uh, is within the preservation program. And the King County uh, program focuses on unincorporated King County and with municipalities that uh, have an intergovernmental, um, interlocal government agreement with the county. So they work with the county um, and agree to use their commission, Landmarks Commission and um, 
get their the landmarks process through through that through the county. It helps for smaller communities because they often don't have the resources to have their own uh, program. And so this is a really um, um, great program and it really covers a big uh, part of the, the area because the county is so big. And here are some resources uh, throughout the county. And what I love about the county's program is um, because they're usually in rural areas or smaller towns, the types of resources that you see are a bit more modest, but also significant as well. And they look at cultural significance and sort of oftentimes more vernacular resources that uh, we all appreciate as well. Um, in the city of Seattle, very different in terms of, it's very urban. We have different kinds of resources. In this Seattle's preservation movement was really a history of citizen action. And we wouldn't have Pioneer Square, Pike Place Market, or the Chinatown International District. Um, it wouldn't look the way it did today if it had not been um, designated historic districts uh, back in the late 60s and early 70s. And you can sort of see here some of this um, history of activism that created these districts. And um, the Pipe Place Market, that whole effort of Keep the Market celebrated its 50 years last year. And in an international special review district, that was created as a response to well, the kingdom was being built and um, the community didn't want their, their important um, neighborhood to be bulldozed for a bunch of parking lots to support a sports stadium. And so that's why the humbow is not hot dogs um, is was sort of the, the tagline for that effort. So in the city of Seattle, um, same thing here on uh, uh, the workshop number three is on the landmark designation specifically in Seattle, and that's April 26th. And Aaron Doherty and our own Jeff Barak will be talking specifically about that program. So this is just an overview to show you um, just sort of what's within that program generally. And the ordinance was established in 1973. It's within the Department of Neighborhoods. And uh, there are more than 400 designated landmarks and it's administered by the um, 12 member landmarks board. And there are eight historic districts. And some of these have their own boards and commissions as well. And here are some examples of some designated Seattle landmarks, many that uh, you know and others maybe not so much. So how do the registers differ? Um, so owner consent is very important. Um, in Seattle, owner consent is not required. Anyone can submit a nomination. So this is really key in terms of what advocates can do um, in terms of uh, working within the system. In King County, it's also not required except for the interlocal government agreements that stipulate owner consent. Uh, I mentioned those earlier in terms of some of the other communities that um, have this sort of um, agreement with the county. And then wa the Washington Heritage Register, own owner consent is required. Uh, the National Register is interesting. So if it's a property is privately owned, then owner's, owner's consent is required. But if it's publicly owned, then it's not. And then, so here's the other thing about um, these registers, uh, regulatory or honorary. That's another important sort of thing to consider. So in Seattle and King County, any and any local um, program that has an ordinance and a board or commission, that is regulatory. And so because it requires review of proposed work and requires a certificate of approval or appropriateness before any other permits are issued. And then there's a landmarks board or commission that reviews work in a public uh, meeting. Um, the Washington Heritage and National Re Registers are honorary. So there are no regulations that come with them um, unless they um, would private funds are used, but if there are public funds used, then there um, it does uh, trigger um, some review processes. So, how can these registers be used effectively for advocacy? For already designated properties, um, there's a significant level of protection and review of pr proposed changes in a public meeting. Um, they're also eligible for incentives and grants. Um, listing on the National Register gives a property formal recognition and acknowledges that the property is significant and confirms 
the significance on a higher level and also um, provides potential access to federal historic tax credits, which makes projects possible oftentimes and grants as well. And for those that aren't already listed, just going through the effort, it, you can get a lot of um, attention by, uh, pro by uh, promoting a property through um, registration or listing or um, nomination, the, the whole nomination process. So the local registers are really a powerful tool that we often use. And these ordinances are the greatest protection for historic resources. It's on this local level where the protection comes from. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, they're protected by design review process and review by a board or commission. So there are over 2,300 preservation ordinances that have been enacted across the country. So it's not um, an outlier or you know, just something that happens um, you know, in a few places is nationwide and it's been well established for decades now. And um, it's also very well grounded legally. And I have here the citation for a very important US Supreme Court decision from 1978, in which um, it involved the Grand Central Station, which I think many of us are familiar with. There was a proposal by the owner, um, Penn Central Transportation Company at the time um, to add a 50 plus story high rise on top of the Grand Central Station. Um, so that spurred on this um, lawsuit and made it all the way up to the Supreme Court. And which essentially said that it's not a, uh, it's not, it wasn't a taking and that um, historic preservation is a permissible governmental goal. And so, um, so that really established sort of a lot of the, the framework and the foundation for a lot of ordinances locally. I wanna give this example of a wonderful um, effort that uh, we were involved in that was successful and involved using the city of Seattle sort of landmarks nomination process. The La Quinta Apartments uh, over at Capitol Hill um, is this wonderful 1920s courtyard apartment building built by Fred Anhall to um, develop a lot of properties in Seattle. And the, a neighbor co contacted us and said that the longtime owner and steward had recently died and they weren't sure what was gonna happen to the property. And so we were alerted of this in the summer of 2020, um, deep into the pandemic. And uh, we met with them and it, you know, looked at the property and um, talked to the residents and some community members. And they really wanted to do something like, how could they save this property, not knowing the future? And so we decided that we would um, do a landmark nomination and we were able to have Northwest Vernacular prepare a nomination quite quickly and submit it. And again, because the Seattle owner consent is not required, we didn't need the owner to, to give the okay to this. We did notify um, the, the estate, the heirs, and so before we submitted the nomination. And um, ultimately they, they, they supported it, which was good for us. Um, and it got landmarked in uh, the first quarter of 2021. And this is one of my favorite photos. It's um, a Seattle now and then image of, of, of us sort of uh, in front of the La Quinta. And it's, it was a wonderful way to sort of involve folks. The, the residents um, created a website. They created this wonderful poster. They took great photographs. So we looked at the skills of the different um, people involved and how they wanted to contribute so that they could have a part of this process. And if it wasn't for them, we would not have been as successful as we were. So, um, and so we were really glad that this worked out. And it, there is a new owner who's actually um, doing some renovations and ex as people move out, so far rents haven't been raised for existing tenants. So, so far this is a happy story. Uh, I wanted to kind of switch over to sort of this um, kind of a more wonky um, aspect of, of what we do, another tool. Um, again, sort of this one by itself could have its own sort of seminar but the State Environmental Policy Act or SEPA and how does it work with historic preservation. Um, so whenever there's a proposed project um, 
it, it might trigger this process. And um, there's a whole list of environmental impacts that might um, occur. Historic and cultural resources is one of them. They look at light, air, noise, traffic, um, aesthetics, a whole list of, of things. And essentially it's a way to determine whether there, there might be um, impacts to historic and cultural resources. And those three determinations that you see are sort of the, the decisions that can be made and about uh, whether a proposed project could impact a, a resource or not. In the Seattle, um, there's a, that doesn't happen in other jurisdictions in the state, I believe. There's this nexus between SEPA and preservation and the land launch process. And if, um, if a project has to go through SEPA and the proposed, uh, and, the, and the resource that's there, the building, um, might be uh, eligible to be a landmark, then that gets referred to the landmark staff. And if they think it might be eligible, they'll have the developer prepare a landmark nomination, um, but they don't want the, the place landmarked. And so we get this sort of weird situation where we kind of call these anti-nominations. So um, they spend time, the same process to look at um, whether, whether the property qualifies or not, or whether it gets designated or not. And so that's sort of what this is uh, related to. Um, I wanna mention briefly, um, you know, we've been talking about a lot about sort of various tools and also sort of specifically some, some um, properties, but sort of looking a little um, farther back is what the work that the National Trust for Historic Preservation's Research and Policy did, Lab did a few years ago was really looking at why these places matter on a broader level and looking at 50 cities of different sizes and why older, smaller buildings and um, neighborhoods with character, why, why this is important. And a lot of this based on you know, what Jane Jacobs and her sort of looking at preservation and building reuse and successful communities. And so it's called the Atlas of Reurbanism, and you can look this up on their website. There's the URL there. But I want to point out at the bottom there, this is a graphic from their website, that in Seattle, only half a percent of parcels and buildings in Seattle are designated Seattle landmarks or in historic districts. So that's very little compared to 4.3% in a 50 city average. And so when you hear people complaining about, oh, everything's gonna get landmarked, I can't do anything on my property, I can't develop anything, is not true um, because half a percent is very little. So how can you get involved? So here's just a list of ways that you can get involved in advocacy. And sometimes it, it doesn't, it takes a few minutes and other times it could take a much longer time uh, and effort. But there are different, um, uh, responding to calls to action is really important. And offering public testimony in public meetings in support of landmarking or national register listing, um, participating in the most endangered list that you'll hear more from uh, soon. Um, joining our organizations um, because um, your support is really important to us. Volunteer. Um, so these are very different levels of engagement that you can take part in. And I'm just gonna end on a high note. One of my favorite photographs, this was taken in 2010 actually in front of the old Alki homestead. Um, and the community really came together and we worked with the Washington Trust, with Fort Culture and the Southwest Seattle Historical Society and the National Trust trying to save this place. Ultimately it was sold to a new owner who renovated it and opened up a wonderful Italian, um, they leased it, leased it to a restaurateur who opened up a wonderful Italian restaurant there. So you could go there and enjoy it now. Um, it was touch and go for a while in terms of what would happen to this property. It is a landmark and it's also listed on the national register. Um, so yeah, so that was a quick run through of some tools and strategies. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me or Jeff and we have our information there. And then I think um, I'm gonna take questions at the end and I'm going to just turn it over to Hui. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Hey, thank you. Thanks Eugenia for that, uh, that first half of the presentation. Can you see my screen and hear me okay? Yep. Great. 
But yeah, so my portion after um, Eugenia spoke on, you know, how Seattle might do, uh, historic Seattle might do advocacy and how to activate that local community, I'm guessing, which most of you guys are calling in or um, zooming in from. So my half, you know, expanding that upward is going to be talking about uh, statewide preservation advocacy and what us here at the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation might be doing. So to start off, the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation is a nonprofit organization dedicated to saving the places that matter in Washington state and to promoting sustainable, economically viable communities through historic preservation. We are Washington's only statewide nonprofit advocacy organization working to build a collective ethic that preserves historic places through education, collaboration, and stewardship. While we're known for being the state level advocates for historic preservation efforts, we really rely on local individuals, coalitions, and organizations like Historic Seattle to inform and partner with us to address those efforts. And we can join as many email lists and public hearing notices and put a Google News alert for words like preservation and demolition. But the best way to be activated is by the community who finds out that information firsthand, whether it's a nonprofit, a government agency, a small business owner, a family or individual, a property owner, a neighbor, or an informal group with a common cause. So when you guys come to us, um, whether you know any of those types of uh, individuals to groups that I mentioned, we utilize that to activate our mission that I mentioned before. And when we activate our mission, we come up with these programs and that's how we activate advocacy. So I joined uh, the Washington Trust about uh, less than a year ago. It's, it's coming close to a year. So I'm still catching up on so many programs and I'm happy to say that uh, since my time here, uh, I was on the come up of when the Washington Trust was expanding almost twofold in many of these program areas. So some of the new ones included uh, the Historic Theater Grant Program, which I'll talk about in the Third Places Fund, as well as the Maritime Washington National Heritage Area. And most of these programs are in partnership with the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation or where the State Historic Preservation Officer, Dr. Allison Brooks, resides from. Um, and we have a strong partnership with our state historic preservation agency, which we're thankful to have. You know, some states and some communities are really uh, either limited or emboldened by their state leadership. And Washington is known as a strong preservation state, both by funding and by policy. So uh, that's a good thing to keep in mind for our local efforts, you know, looking upward for state, federal uh, assistance and support. But the main programs that might be most relevant to today's uh, presentation is the one I, are the ones I highlighted in orange, and that's going to be our national and state public policy uh, advocacy, as well as our most endangered places. So when we learn about local historic preservation or preservation adjacent place based issues, we look to these program areas that we offer and the two that I highlighted. Uh, are the most relevant, but keep in mind that all of our programs with some semblance uh, requires advocacy, which includes communities joining together to identify a need, coming up with a solution or a program or a policy, and then working with those policymakers, legislatures, and resource managers at all levels to provide the best outcome. So even with those five um, DAP Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation grant programs that you see at the bottom, all of those still require advocacy of us getting testimonies from barn owners or from cemetery owners or even uh, theater surveys and, and community gathering space surveys and, and, um, and testimonies and public comments, public letters, and really corralling a community to say, hey, this is a resource, a historic resource that needs attention or funding or specific policies to help maintain and to help utilize and reactivate within our community. And you'll see that um, a little bit more when I talk about them later. So the first uh, segment, I guess, would be the national and state public policy. So at the federal level, every year, the Washington Trust participates in National Historic Preservation Advocacy Week in March in partnership with that, organiz that nonprofit organization Eugenia mentioned earlier, Preservation Action. 
in which over 200 preservation advocates visit their congressional representatives to advocate for historic preservation-friendly policies, bills, and budget appropriations. And the big items that we talk about every single year is the historic tax credit and the, um, and the uh, historic preservation fund. The historic tax credit is really important because it allows uh, developers, investors, communities to uh, utilize a historic tax credit that uh, allows them to have amazing historic preservation projects such as Climate Pledge Arena, which uh, we think is the, the biggest or largest historic preservation tax credit project in the state and maybe the country because it is a uh, $1.1 billion restoration project because it, it was the restoration of a uh, World's Fair arena building. Um, so it is a, a historic building. Um, because it used over a billion dollars, it had about $500 million of historic, uh, what they call um, like eligible expenses that goes towards a historic tax credit. And that tax credit, you know, um, provides, uh, activates jobs in the community for, you know, people in construction. Obviously it creates a new place, a new venue for people to spend their money on. And it, it puts about, for that specific project, it put about $200 million back into the community just because it was a historic preservation project. And then for the historic preservation fund, um, it is the annual budget that supports state historic preservation offices like GAP and tribal historic preservation offices and competitive grant programs, which gave way to uh, programs such as the Third Places Fund, which was unique to Washington State. It was a program that the Washington Trust and GAP uh, pitched and created out of the Paul Broon Historic Re Revitalization Grant Program, which is uh, appropriated out of the Historic Preservation Fund. So even at the federal level, sometimes you might think like, well, how is that gonna trickle down to you know, Seattle or where I'm living or my community? But there is so many uh, venues and policies and programs that do go all the way down to the local level. Um, and then of course, there's other important programs uh, like the Underrepresented Communities Grant, which uh, DAP will be announcing that they just got one um, for this uh, upcoming year to, uh, to talk about Chinese American heritage and then uh, history of equal rights grants, tribal heritage grants. There's all kinds of federal and uh, national grants that you can see trickle down into community because uh, organizations like the Washington Trust, Historic Seattle, and even the State Department advocate for, um, put out RFPs for uh, pitch to the National Park Service, whoever, whoever's running these programs to, uh, to provide to us, and then we activate them and put them out to the community where they need it most. And then at the state level, we also uh, attend Heritage Caucus, which is uh, the state version of Advocacy Week, in which at 7 a.m. we meet in Olympia, but this year it was in, on Zoom and speak directly to our legislature, specifically uh, Senator Honeyford and Representative Theringer, about how specific bills may affect historic preservation efforts in the state each year. Uh, this year, we focused mainly on Main Street resilience through the pandemic. So we saw um, a, uh, a bill that increased Main Street budget uh, programs to make sure that you know, they, they thrive and recover from you know, pandemic um, downswings, and uh, as well as providing update to the Maritime Washington National Heritage Area Management Plan, which is a Congress approved national heritage area through the National Park Service program, which is you know, collective branding of our coastline um, to spur tourism, heritage conservation, and, and you know, trades uh, celebration throughout each of those coastline communities. And then next year, and also every other year, we look forward to advocating for the expansion and increased funding towards those five gap grant programs that I mentioned for courthouses, barns, theaters, cemeteries, and so on. So uh, in this way, if, if you guys as community members tell us what you need from the state or from the federal agencies through bills and policies, you know, we can attend advocacy week or those 7 a.m. Uh, weekly heritage caucus meetings rather than you have to. And of course, you're always welcome to come along, but this is one way that we as a nonprofit agency offer our services in advocacy. 
So then finally, uh, sliding down to that local scale, this is where maybe traditional um, understandings of preservation comes from, um, where we get into place-specific advocacy, trying to prevent a historic structure or a site from being demolished or haphazardly replaced. But also keep in mind that policy advocacy can happen at the local level too. Like if your city or county is seeking public comments on public transit routes or deconstruction as an alternative to demolition ordinance or green building and affordable housing initiatives or tribal native sacred cultural placemaking or public history programs. All of those can relate to historic preservation and can also be used as a reminder of the historic preservation ethic. Um, sometimes uh, people don't think that green energy or affordable housing is historic preservation related or even historic preservation supported, but that's because they might not have either the studies or the means or the rhetoric or the, um, the argument uh, arguments to support those initiatives for a better community and a better green earth, right? Um, they say the, the greenest building is the one that's already built. Uh, there's plenty of studies out there that say that historic preservation is a venue for affordable housing. I know that's a, a big talking point, both uh, locally in Seattle, but nationwide. How can historic preservationists uh, advocate for affordable housing? So instead of, you know, butting heads against one another, it's taking a step back, rethinking like, hey, what are ways that we can work together to achieve the same priorities at the, um, you know, at the uh, city planning level? And the programs that we offer to this kind of area, um, obviously is you know just general local advocacy, but if it escalates like there is a specific plan or a specific goal, we could put it on the most endangered places list, um, which is just a more formal version of, you know, beginning to write a letter of support to your local council or your landmarks commission. You know, it might start with that, but then it can escalate with campaign and with a specific campaign or specific advocacy strategy. Uh, we also offer organizing, evaluating resources, uh, providing photo and video for publicity and social media, using public testimony, like if um, I were to submit a letter on behalf of the Washington Trust or, or speak um, two to three minutes at a public hearing. We could also organize stakeholder community meetings, uh, town halls for a you know, design charrette or a demolition alternative workshop, identifying potential funding support, like connecting with um, our network, our develop, uh, uh, developers and partners to see if, hey, is there any other alternative to, you know, demolishing this building or replacing it with something? Can we think of an adaptive reuse? Can we think of putting an addition? Can we think of saving some the most important parts. There's different ways, but all that to say is through our local advocacy in most endangered places, what the Washington Trust offers is creative solutions, industry expertise, network access, and consistent engagement and presence. Because obviously as community members, you guys care about these places, but you might be a teacher, you might be a trades worker, you might be a business owner, and you don't have time or the means or the, the ability to attend those public meetings or to write to your um, to your representative or your local policymakers, and we offer that kind of assistance um, because advocacy we need to be always present, right? Like make sure we know what's going on in the news or uh, when a permit has been issued or applied for or when a state environmental policy act step has progressed towards the demolition or a replacement or a redesign project. Um, we try to offer that industry expertise and make sure that we know what's going on in a placemaking or historic preservation um, process. With that, um, I'm going to offer a few case studies of, uh, of recent local advocacy campaigns or most endangered places listings within the past few years. Um, some of them are still active, so we, we look to your support in joining us towards act. Uh, uh, advocating for their preservation. And then some of them um, most recently just entered the SAVE status. Um, I'll be excited to share that. But beginning um, with the top lap with the Chancery Building in Spokane, it was a 1910 Western Union Life Insurance Building that was uh, bought and owned by the Roman Catholic Diocese in 1966. Uh, but it was uh, recently 
you know, uh, been vacant in maybe the past five years to the past full decade of the city trying to figure out what to do with it because the diocese either didn't want or didn't need it anymore. And it was brought to our attention by the Spokane uh, Preservation Advocates. And right now it's it's going through um, private development negotiations with the city through the State Environmental Protection Act, which Eugenia mentioned earlier, uh, is activated when a national register or a state heritage register property uh, utilizes a state undertaking like a state permit or state funding. Um, it has to go through a special review process in which public comments are taken and environmental impact statements are created by professional consultants to create a recommendation for the historic resource. So right now it's, it's not quite in a full public phase, but we do know that you know, developers are looking to demolish it. That's their number one goal. And when the public comment phase opens, we're looking to um, activate the community and say, hey, like this is a great building. Not only is it environmentally detrimental to demolish it and replace it with something brand new, um, there's also a lot of uh, heritage and cultural um, and even aesthetic reasons to keep it around and to actively reuse it. You know, you might not use it for a life insurance building or a Catholic diocese office, but you can still use it to create some very interesting housing or offices or, or venue spaces. Um, and that's just something that sometimes needs to be said out loud or on paper to a city council group or a local landmarks group to make uh, more thoughtful decisions during that city planning process. Next would be the Masonic home in Des Moines, which is a 1926 retirement community for uh, the Masonic Society. And it was sold to private developers in 2013 to 2019. It was like a six year process, but a demolition process or a demolition permit was filed with the city in July of 2019 and then reapplied in 2020. And similarly with the Chancery Building, it's going through those SEPA environmental impact statement phase. Uh, it's a little ahead of the curve because they already have a, um, I think like last month, the city approved of a third party consultant to conduct that environmental impact statement draft. So that's what they're going through now. Like a professional is gonna to go to that resource, do the research and create a report that says, this is the historic significance of it. And this is what we're looking to do or what we recommend the city or whomever does with the structure. So those are two ongoing campaigns that we're trying to keep an eye on with, you know, uh, talking to community members, keeping those Google alerts on, uh, making sure we're on those public hearing notices. Pritchard Library in Olympia um, is the next example. It's a 1958 Washington State Library at the Capitol campus. And it was going on, uh, it was um, an ongoing project through the Legislative Campus Modernization Project, which means that they're trying to modernize the state legislature uh, Capitol campus. And at first, uh, in some of the pre designs, they were going to simply demolish it. But through working with the LCM um, you know, public consultation group and really advocating for making sure that it wasn't a hasty determination that, oh, the state or whomever can't afford or, or feasibly, literally, engineeringly cannot rehab the structure, we pushed back on that. And now they say, okay, you're right, we can rehab the structure. So instead of demolishing it, they, um, through legislation committed to preserving the structure and putting on a rear addition rather than a demo and replace. Um, and that is uh, uh, an ongoing project. So now instead of having to advocate for not demolishing it, now we have to advocate for making sure that the addition, that rear addition design is sensitive, appropriate to the historic structure. So um, other partners include uh, Dokomomo of the, um, the, the Northwest chapter and other community groups, I think they created a um, like a specific capital campus group just to make sure that we're always on top and always attending those uh, public consultation meetings. Next we have uh, Nettie J. Asbury House in Tacoma. It was an 1887 house of community advocates and iconic leaders in the black community, both locally and regional, regionally with um, Henry Joseph and Nettie Craig Jones Asbury for uh, its acquisition. Um, so the, the first, the house needed to be acquired um, 
by the Tacoma City Association of Colored Women's Club. And then they needed to have a preservation plan on how to make sure it's restored to active use for a public history space. And uh, we're happy to say that uh, it was landmarked by the uh, city of Tacoma in January of this year. And through other funding and advocacy sources um, or advocacy initiatives, uh, the Washington Trust was able to provide it with a Savinsky grant uh, back in December that they'll utilize through this year to uh, produce a historic preservation plan and through uh, uh, state appropriations received additional, um, I think like hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to help the Tacoma, um, the Tacoma Colored Women's Club to acquire the property towards this public his history uh, project um, of preserving and utilizing and celebrating such an important structure that embodies uh, the work of Nitty uh, J. Asbury. And then a unique one uh, that you know we haven't seen in a while is basically we listed all the historic theaters in Washington, uh, which a 2008 study identified over 80 of them um, to the most endangered places list. And uh, efforts to establish the, uh, the historic theaters grant program began as early as 2008 when the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation commissioned Artifacts Consulting to conduct a statewide historic theater survey in which they found that um, addressing the safety improvements, building system deterioration, deferred maintenance, accessibility challenges, and other code compliance issues of the over 80 identified historic theaters would come at the cost of more than $38 million. So that means that in 2008, which was 14 years ago, um, the state or uh, historic theaters were already deferred or behind on $38 million of historic preservation renovations and projects to make sure that they were up to code and, and the most best condition that they could be in. So uh, rebolding through the pandemic when we saw that um, with a survey uh, conducted in April of 2021, 72 theaters reported being closed completely in the past year. And historic theater owners reported um, a total of $3 million in additional uh, lost income due to COVID-19 with an average of $240,000 of losses per theater um, from 2021 all the way back to 2008. All that momentum led to the, uh, the first cycle of the historic theater grant program, which was the latest program to be added to the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation's capital improvement grant programs um, that we have the privilege of managing here at the Washington Trust. And for that first cycle, $300,000 were provided um, to give out. And uh, last month, we announced eight theaters would be receiving uh, grants from that program. But of course, more than uh, more than three times that amount of money was requested from applications. That means like people need historic theater dollars to preserve their theaters, but the state only has so many to give out. So that is uh, an advocacy project that we're looking forward to taking to the state legislature next year saying, thank you for the first cycle. It's been a successful project. Check out these great theater projects that have been completed by that time. and. Uh, because more than three times the amount of money was requested, we're looking to expand and request increased funding for that program. So that is another way that the Washington State um, does advocacy. And then finally, the Beverly Bridge was a 1909 bridge that was closed off by 1980, and it was just reopened with a dedication ceremony last Friday, um, which uh, Chris Moore and I, our executive director for the Washington Trust, Chris Moore, and I were at, uh, and he got to sit next to the uh, Governor Inslee and uh, provide this testimony. And he much more succinctly explains the advocacy process for uh, for this um, this most endangered place that was listed in 2017. So keep in mind that this was a, basically a five year project. Um, so let's see if I can play this video. You guys here? Yeah. 
you guys hear this? I might need to reshare with the sound. I think you need to share it with the sound. Success story is how it got funded and how it came together with so many different partners uh, to get this done. And, and when it finally got done, it was a surprising and an amazingly clever approach. And our next speaker, executive director of the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation, was deeply involved in this. And he's here to tell us more about this remarkable story. Please give a kind welcome to Chris Moore. Thank you very much, John. Thank you to the Buck family for being here and welcoming everybody. Uh, really, really just thrilled to be here today. Two quick points that I want to make. One is around advocacy and one is around actually project review, which doesn't sound all that exciting, but trust me, uh, with regard to this project, it is. The Washington Trust for Historic Preservation is a statewide advocacy organization. We work to preserve historic resources across the state. We do that in part by having an annual most endangered, uh, most endangered properties list where we try to raise awareness about properties. In 2017, a group of advocates came together to nominate the Beverly Bridge that included the backcountry horsemen it included the palouse to cascades trail coalition the cascade rail foundation and the john wayne pioneer wagons and riders all came together to say look we need to raise awareness about this bridge about the gap that it creates in our cross state trail let's see what we can do about it and so we included that in our list and we committed staff time uh technical expertise advocacy time to help raise that awareness we had a really good opportunity and this is where the project review piece comes in we had a really good opportunity when there was a project proposed by the burlington northern santa fe railroad bnsf they needed to remove three historic railroad bridges along the columbia river when you have a project like that you look at, at what might be lost from a historic standpoint, and you think about how can we mitigate that? We weren't gonna stop those three historic bridges from being removed, but we could think about how do we mitigate that loss with something else? And we got really creative, and I wanna give a real shout out to Dr. Allison Brooks and the Department of Archeology span and Historic Preservation. They're a state agency that oversees some of these historic reviews. And they were able to get creative as well and say, well, we're gonna lose these three bridges, but what if we can save or do something to help save another one? We knew the Beverly Bridge was part of this trail. We knew it was owned by the state, by DNR, with jurisdiction by state parks. And we said, geez, what if we could get some dollars to at least do a study and figure out how much it would cost to bring this bridge back and restore the gap? Um, BNSF provided $125,000. It came to our organization. We commissioned that study. We had it done. And from that came a number. I got a call from uh, John Snyder, who needs to be recognized as well with the governor's office on recreation to say, look, we might have an opportunity. There could be an idea around actually taking those numbers and seeing if we can get it into the budget. And I know uh, the, the, the logistics of it was, we now have the study, we now have the numbers, those numbers got in front of the governor's office, and I credit the governor.